Welcome to the University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology YouTube channel. This video cast is on cardiac topics, specifically keyword review of the 2018 keywords. Keywords are published by the American Board of Anesthesia on specific questions that were asked on the in-training exam and they can be used as a guide for your study. These are the cardiac keywords from 2018 on topics such as anatomy and physiology, where does our central venous catheter go on chest x-ray, what are some of the landmarks, the anatomy of the aortic valve and the left ventricle on echo, where do the coronary arteries go and which walls do they supply, the sympathetic nervous system and its ganglia, oculocardiac reflex and anatomy of such, there's some monitoring topics such as how does frequency affect our ultrasound probe, arterial pressure waveform, uh, starling curve and volume status monitoring, and mixed venous oxygen saturation monitoring, some of the factors that affect it. Preoperatively, what if you hear a heart murmur, what's the significance? Pre-anesthetic evaluation cardiac, a large topic, uh, including uh, ACC AHA guidelines for stents, and what if you have a pacemaker in, what do those three letters mean? Pathology, things like how do we give medications during ACLS, cardiac tamponade and the management of such, complications of carcinoid syndrome, right-sided heart valve specifically, myocardial ischemia and how beta blockers uh, are used to treat it. And then under pharmacology, how does nitric oxide inhaled work, protamines and, and some of the problems with protamine administration, arginine vasopressin, how it works, some of our medications that can prolong the QT interval, Drugs that can drop the blood pressure and be used to control uh, blood pressure and drop it under controlled hypotension situations. Sodium nitroprusside and its toxicity. And then retrograde cardioplegia, some of the indications. If you want an extensive and comprehensive keyword review of uh, almost a decade of keywords uh, through 2017, our YouTube channel, Cardiac Keyword Review Part 1, 2, and 3 are present and you may want to go to those and review them. This is the 2018 keywords on cardiac topics beginning with central venous catheter, chest x-ray landmarks. And a gap in knowledge was uh, from some time ago that when viewed on a chest x-ray, the correct position of the tip of a central venous catheter placed via the right IJ is above the level of the carina. So a picture on the top right shows the tip of the cardiovascular catheter the carina being below it, division of the right main stem into the left main stem, and the tip should be just above that level of the carina. It should lie within the superior vena cava on the bottom right graphic, the arrow pointing to that location, and the red arrow showing where in the SVC the catheter should end. Because if it's too high, you can erode vessels. If it's too low, it could sit in the right atrium or even in the right ventricle, damage the uh, tricuspid valve, go into the coronary sinus, cause dysrhythmias as it bangs against the wall of the atria or the ventricle. So the point of this keyword was knowing that the right IJ central venous catheter tip should be at just above the level of the carina on a chest x-ray. The next topic is TEE anatomy, and I'll combine left ventricle and aortic valve, which were two key words from 2018. And there are four major views that I want to focus on. The first is the mid-esophageal four-chamber view on TEE, of which you can see all four chambers, the right atrium, the right ventricle, the left atrium, and the left ventricle. And with regards to the left ventricle, it is the lateral wall, which I'm pointing to right now, and the septum that you see on the mid-esophageal four-chamber, that part of the left ventricle wall. The anterior is in front of it, inferior is behind it. You do not see those in this cut. You see the tricuspid valve on the right side of the heart, the mitral valve on the left side of the heart, interatrial septum, good uh, view for PFO detection, and you can see the coronary sinus, and this is where a retrograde cardioplegia catheter goes in the coronary sinus to deliver high potassium containing solutions to rest the heart and diastole. The view in the top right is a mid-esophageal bicable view with the SVC to the right and the inferior vena cava to the left, the left atrium closest to the TE probe, interatrial septum between the left atrium and the right atrium, and that is a good view to look for also a PFO and it's a good view when you're placing your uh, central line, you can watch your guide wire come down through, you can watch your PA catheter come down through there, 
um, that's the midesophageal bicable. Midesophageal two chamber, again focusing on the left ventricle um, and the anatomy of such. In the two chamber view at 90 degrees midesophageal, midesophageal position, you see the anterior wall to the right of the heart and you see the inferior wall to the left. And you see the mitral valve in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. The atrial appendage is in the anterior portion of the heart and this left atrial appendage can have clots in it. And this is a view that we would look at for example, if we we're going to uh, cardiovert someone and wanted to make sure that there was no clot present in that left atrial appendage. And in the bottom right is what's called the midesophageal RV inflow outflow view in which the aortic valve is in short axis in the middle of this view. Important point is that you see all three cuspids of, of the normal aortic valve with the non-coronary cusp lying against the interatrial septum, the most anterior being the right coronary cusp, and the left coronary cusp being uh, labeled LCC here. Notice again that the non-coronary cusp is next to the interatrial septum. Coronary artery distribution is the next key word. The dominant coronary artery is defined by what gives off, either the right or the left uh, coronary, gives off the posterior descending. Usually it comes off the right coronary artery and that's considered a right dominant system. If a PDA comes off the left circumflex, it's called a left dominant system. Usually the AV node is supplied by the right coronary artery. Occasionally in a small uh, percentage, left circumflex supplies it. So if the right coronary artery is acutely occluded, you could see how the AV node could be uh, malperfused and AV nodal block, heart block could occur. The left anterior descending coronary artery supplies the anterior wall and in the graphic on the bottom left in blue represents the anterior wall in the short axis view of the uh, transgastric mid-papillary TEE. The anterior wall is, correlates with V1 through V6 on your EKG anterior electrocardiographic leads. The lateral wall is supplied by the left circumflex coronary artery represented by the color red in the bottom and it's the lateral EKG leads that correlate with this lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6. The right coronary artery supplies the inferior wall and the inferior septum and the inferior EKG leads are 2, 3, and AVF. To point out one more time, the AV node supply is usually from the right coronary artery, and if you had a right coronary artery acute occlusion with inferior wall not moving, you may also have heart block. The picture on the bottom right is a picture of a TEE, midesophageal four-chamber view, pointing out all four chambers of the heart, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. And in this view, you are seeing the lateral wall um, and the septum, the lateral wall being supplied by the circumflex coronary artery, the septum uh, being mainly the LAD. The next key word is sympathetic nervous system ganglion. Let's first remind uh, you of the innervation of the heart. The vagus nerve uh, releases acetylcholine uh, to the SA and AV node mainly and can reduce heart rate and conduction through the AV node, some effect on inotropy. The sympathetics more richly innervate the heart and they release norepinephrine um, from their fibers and the cardio accelerators specifically come from T1 through T4, remembering that the sympathetics we usually think of thoracic 1 through L2 predominantly. T1 through T4 are the cardio accelerators. And when a spinal anesthetic sensory level gets up into that region, we know that the sympathetic uh, block occurs several levels above that, and you can get bradycardia associated with it. The sympathetic fibers, uh, when they innervate the SA and the AV node, can increase chronotropy or heart rate, dromotropy or conduction through the AV node and they also innervate the cardiac muscle, releasing norepinephrine and through beta-1 receptors can cause increased inotropy. Now let's focus in on the uh, main point of the key word, which is sympathetic ganglia. Where are they? They're paravertebral, up and down from the neck to the coccyx, these little paravertebral sympathetic ganglia. From the spine comes out white rami communicons, uh, circled in the bottom right graphic, and these preganglionic fibers are short, and they synapse in the sympathetic ganglion. From the sympathetic ganglion come gray rami communicons, the long ones that are the sympathetic fibers from the ganglia uh, out to spinal nerves and release norepinephrine. In the neck, we think of the stellate ganglion, which can be blocked in chronic pain, 
syndromes like CRPS, celiac plexus that's in the abdomen and supplies a lot of the um, gut and pancreas and, and patients with um, uh, cancer of the pancreas and dying in intractable pain can be palliated with celiac plexus block. And in the pelvis, uh, the ganglion, ganglion impar, which can be blocked in patients with uh, pelvic pain syndromes. Let's move now to a reflux, oculocardiac reflux keyword, which involves cranial nerve 5 and 10 as compared to cranial nerve 9 and 10, which was the carotid sinus reflux. So when you tug on the eyeball, these muscles stretched, you can get bradycardia. Why does that happen? Because the muscles are innervated uh, by ciliary nerves. The afferents come from those ciliary nerves to the ciliary ganglion cranial nerve via the Gesserian ganglion to the brainstem, so that's all cranial nerve 5 to the brainstem. And then the efferent pathway is the vagus nerve, uh, cranial nerve number 10, and you get bradycardia, such that during strabismus surgery, a retrobulbar block, pushing on the eyeball, all can stimulate this reflex and result in bradycardia. In eye surgery, it tends to fatigue very quickly. Um, uh, a retrobulbar block, when it sets up well, can uh, block some of the effects of this. Um, and simply letting go of the eye muscle tug uh, and the heart rate will come back. Important point is that anticholinergic agents prophylactically do not uh, block this per se. And if it occurs intraoperatively, stop the tugging on the eyeball. If it remains uh, bradycardic and hemodynamically unstable, atropine can be administered. The next key word is ultrasound probe and frequency effect. Doppler principle is used in ultrasound and as these sound waves are sent towards a target, if the target is moving away from you or towards you, there's a Doppler shift and this frequency shift is used to calculate velocities. The Doppler probe first of all has to be parallel to flow either away or towards the probe. It cannot be perpendicular. If it's perpendicular to flow, it measures zero velocity because there is no Doppler shift. Another important point is that frequency is proportional to one over the time between successive peaks or troughs of a wave. And that is in echocardiography. We're using frequencies of 2 to 10 megahertz, which is 2 to 10 million cycles per second. So that would be uh, 1 over 0. 0.0000, you know, you can calculate that. It's a very high frequency uh, because at very high frequencies, you get better resolution. And at the lower frequencies, we get deeper penetration. And the way I like to remember that is if I'm hearing music from the distance, I often hear the bass and the drums, uh, and I don't hear the higher frequencies because low frequencies travel a long distance. They penetrate far, or high frequencies where there's a small distance between waves allow us to resolve things, have a better resolution, and we can see smaller things. We use pulse wave Doppler to look at specific places uh, uh, on a location um, and continuous wave Doppler on the bottom right sends uh, sound waves in a continuous pattern and allows us to measure anywhere along that pathway the velocity but not specifically at a specific location like pulse wave can. The next key word is arterial pressure wave and starling curve. The starling curve is represented on the x and y axis with preload and its effect on stroke volume and usually as preload goes up stroke volume goes up and in the classic Frank starling curve it goes up but then starts to flatten and if we give too much preload we can go off the Frank starling curve and get into problems. Now if we superimpose the effect of um, increasing preload on pulse pressure variation with respiration. That's what is represented here. So when you have a low preload and you're on a low part of this uh, starling curve, you can see that there is increased pulse pressure variation with respiration. That is, the thoracic pressure changes have a greater effect on our arterial pressure waveform. And at high preloads, when you have adequate uh, resuscitated preload, there is little pulse pressure variation with respiration. You can trace that over and look at uh, there is also little effect on stroke volume. This is the concept of pulse pressure variation and using that as a way to judge how much fluids to give. If you have 
lots of pulse pressure variation, we say, hmm, they probably will respond to fluids and we should give some. If there is little pulse pressure variation, we say, hmm, they're probably adequately volume resuscitated. That takes us to the next keyword, which is volume status monitoring. There is pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation that we use to try to dynamically predict what's going to happen if we give fluid to a patient. CVP measure is a static measure of pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, a static measure of pressure. And we know that they're not necessarily the best predictors of a response to fluids. And so we can do things like passive leg lift. When we lift the legs, as in the graphic in the top right, it's like giving a bunch of fluid to a patient and look at what happens to stroke volume or blood pressure with these self-volume loads. If it was a negative effect, you could immediately drop the legs and say, ooh, it's a good thing I didn't give a couple liters of fluid to this patient. As opposed to if it was a positive effect, you might say, hmm, okay, that's going to predict that I could give volume to this patient and they will respond with an increase in stroke volume and blood pressure. We take advantage of these heart-lung interactions during mechanical ventilation and measure things like pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. The examples in the middle are stroke volume variation occurring during inspiration and expiration and pulse pressure variation occurring during inspiration and expiration. You probably remember that for these to be good measures of heart-lung interactions and volume status, that characteristically the patient should uh, have neuromuscular blockade, not be breathing spontaneously, and the tidal volumes being at least 8 mils per kilogram. So if you are meeting those conditions, you can see that when the mechanical ventilator kicks in with inspiration, it's like squeezing the blood vessels in the chest and the left ventricle gets a little bit more blood initially and stroke volume goes up and then it goes down with expiration. Now that's the uh, same thing that happens with pulse pressure. Um, and so the more variation there is, the more chance that they will respond it, uh, to volume with a reduction in stroke volume variation and a reduction in pulse pressure variation. We can also look at the inferior vena cava size with ultrasound and you can see that at the bottom right the IVC in a hypovolemic patient if you give positive pressure ventilation as the intrathoracic pressure rises it's like uh, reducing blood flow coming back from the inferior cava into the right atrium and it gets bigger um, uh, during inspiration, mechanical inspiration. Factors affecting SVO2 or mixed venous oxygen is the next key word. Mixed venous oxygen is a global measure of oxygenization. We sample characteristics from the distal tip of the pulmonary artery catheter in the pulmonary artery, main PA or possibly the right or left uh, branch PA. And normally if we take a specimen from there, the saturation is about 70% with a uh, PVO2 of about 40 millimeters of mercury. What are the factors affecting it? Well, cardiac output, how much blood's going to the tissues. VO2, how much oxygen the tissues are using, and then the content of oxygen in the blood, and the content is highly dependent upon hemoglobin. So if we look at the graphic on the far right, you can see that as blood leaves the uh, lungs, goes into the left atrium oxygenated, the normal SAO2, our pulse oximeter, is usually reading in the high 90s, or at least we hope it is, and if we have a hemoglobin of 13 to 15 grams per deciliter, we have a pretty good content. And so cardiac output times uh, content tells us about the oxygen that's delivered to the tissue. Our normal cardiac output, about 5 liters per minute or so. And if we have a normal content, we have about 20 mils of oxygen bound for each deciliter of blood, or about 200 mils of oxygen for each liter of blood. So if there's 5 liters being pumped with 200 mils of oxygen in each liter, that means about a thousand mils of oxygen, which is the DO2 or delivery of oxygen to the tissue. Now at one metabolic equivalent, one met, we are using at baseline 250 mils of oxygen. So you can see that if we're delivering a thousand mils of oxygen, we're only using 250 mils of oxygen, there's going to be oxygen that returns and therefore uh, when we measure mixed venous saturation it's not totally desaturated, in fact it normally has a saturation of about 70%. So what are some things that could increase this? Well, if you're not using oxygen at the tissue level, cyanide poisoning the tissues, cytochrome AA3 poisoned, we can't use the oxygen that comes to the tissue, it goes around and back and the mixed venous is high. Hypothermia, the tissues are not metabolizing and using oxygen as much. Very high cardiac outputs. 
like sepsis early on, or uh, left to right shunts, and AV fistulas, and liver disease, which is associated with shunts, very and high cardiac output also. Your characteristically, your cirrhotic patient has a high cardiac output, like 10, 12 uh, liters, a low SVR, a blood pressure of like 90, and they are pumping blood in high amounts to the tissues and have shunts and those shunts are resulting in that low systemic vascular resistance. So when you do your liver transplants and you look at your PA data, they often have high cardiac output and a mixed venous that is high. Decreased mixed venous, well if you don't have much hemoglobin binding oxygen carrying it to the tissues or you're using a whole bunch at the tissues like shivering or fever or your lungs just aren't very good and not oxygenating it, hypoxia and ARDS, or the pump is not good and not pumping enough blood to the tissues like an MI, CHF, or severe hypovolemia. The next key word is pre-anesthetic heart murmur and what's the significance of that? Let's first divide heart murmurs into systolic versus diastolic. A systolic murmur would occur between the R wave and the end of the T wave, which is EKG inscription of systole. The end of the T wave to the beginning of the QRS complex is diastole. So when you're listening to a patient, you're feeling for their pulse, and uh, you feel a pulse and you hear a systolic murmur, it's characteristically one of two. Aortic stenosis, blood being ejected through a small aortic valve, or mitral regurgitation, blood being ejected from the left ventricle backwards through the mitral valve to the left atrium during systole. Diastolic murmur, blood going from the aortic valve backwards into the left ventricle, aorta, aortic valve, left ventricle, that would be an insufficient aortic valve, and then mitral stenosis when blood is trying to fill the left ventricle during diastole from the left atrium through a stenotic mitral valve and it inscribes a diastolic murmur or you hear a diastolic murmur. Now in 2017 the American Heart Association American College of Cardiology published some guidelines on valvular disease. And basically the take home message was if you look at severity on echocardiography reports and you have a patient with moderate or severe disease, which could be based on pressure gradients, etc., but the cardiologist says this is moderate aortic stenosis, for example, and the patient has symptoms such as heart failure or shortness of breath, that is considered significant and is associated with uh, perioperative risk. And we should especially take notice of that patient. So symptomatology plus severity, moderate or severe, results in the significant status that is recognized by these guidelines. Pre-anesthetic evaluation cardiac. First of all, the revised cardiac risk index, or RCRI, for preoperative risk is used in many preoperative clinics. And we need to know some of those factors that are used to help score a patient and estimate the risk of cardiac complications after surgery. First of all, is it a high-risk surgery in the abdomen or thorax? or vascular surgery above the groin? Do they have ischemic heart disease, previous MI, they're having chest pain, using nitrates? Are they in heart failure? Uh, one of the highest risk uh, things that a patient can have in the perioperative period and uh, cause postoperative cardiac problems, congestive heart failure. Have they had a stroke or a TIA? Are they using insulin and are their kidneys not so good with a creatinine greater than two? Those are the factors that make up that index. On the far right is should we get an ECG in everybody in the pre-anesthesia evaluation? The answer is of course not. If they don't have any signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease and they're undergoing low risk surgery or even intermediate risk surgery with no real RCRI clinical risk factors, we don't get an EKG. But if they have signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease, of course you're going to get an EKG. If they're having high risk surgery, uh, uh, we're going to get an ECG, and if they have intermediate risk surgery and at least one of those RCRI clinical risk factors, our guidelines suggest we should get an ECG. Our next guideline is related to stents. What do we do in a patient with a coronary stent? And that's the graphic on the left. If a patient has a bare metal stent, usually we should wait at least 30 days per our guidelines in a drug eluting stent, preferably a year. Now, newer guidelines suggest that elective non-cardiac surgery after a drug eluting stent can be considered after 180 days or half a year, uh, but preferably still a year if you can. On the far right is the uh, well-known ACCH guidelines for what do you do 
about testing patients in the preoperative period. And let's just step briefly through it. If you have a patient scheduled for surgery with known or risk factors for coronary artery disease, if it's emergent, you take them to surgery. If it's not emergent, you're going to start your evaluation. You're going to estimate the preoperative risk of having a postoperative cardiac complication. If it's a low risk, you're not going to do any further testing and you're going to proceed to surgery. If they're uh, considered a, a elevated risk, you're going to say, okay, what can they do functionally? Can they do more than four METs, climb more than two stairs? Remember, uh, two flights of stairs, that is. Remember that one metabolic equivalent is equal to 250 mils of oxygen basal metabolic rate. So they, can they increase their basal metabolic rate to four METs or 1,000 mils of oxygen each minute being used? If they can, that indicates that you probably don't need to do any further testing. And if they can do more than 10 METs, no further testing, that's a class 2A versus a 2B indication for just 4 to 10 METs. So the more they can do functionally, the better. That's pretty obvious. If they don't have good functional capacity, they can't climb two flights of stairs, can't do four METs, and or you can't get them up to do it. They have bad hips or bad claudication. Pharmacologic stress testing could be indicated, and these can help guide whether coronary revascularization should be done prior to uh, an elective surgery. Pacemaker nomenclature is the next key word. The three first letters are the most important ones for us to remember. The first letter refers to what chamber is paced, the second to what's uh, sensed, and what is the response. Um, so a DDD would be dual chamber paced, dual chamber sensed, and uh, depending on what's going on in the atrioventricle, it could either inhibit or pace the patient. As opposed to a VOO would be a ventricle paced, and really nothing sensed or no response. It just continuously pumps out whatever the rate is set at, let's say a rate of 70. And when you put a magnet on the generator of many pacemakers, it will convert them uh, to asynchronous VO mode at that rate that it's set at. For example, 70, 80, put the pacer on, and it just starts firing at that rate. The problem with that is if you have an intrinsic beat that occurs, you could have the pacer occurring at an R on T and you could get into some bad dysrhythmia. So asynchronous is kind of an emergency backup type um, pacing. So paced, sensed, and response. The picture at the top right shows a classic pacer with a wire in the atria, a wire in the uh, ventricle on the right side of the heart um, that allows DDD pacing. Um, a couple other points. If you want to put a pulmonary catheter in someone with a pacemaker, if that pacemaker was put in less than a month ago, it may not have fibrosed well to the walls, and you may dislodge it as you float your PA catheter. If you're going to use an electrocautery dispersion pad uh, for surgery, put them far away from the generator. Um, it's not an absolute uh, contraindication if someone needs an MRI and they have a pacemaker in place with our modern pacemakers, but you should check with the manufacturer and make sure. And there's no evidence that anesthetic drugs alter the, uh, the stimulation thresholds of a pacemaker. So choosing one anesthetic over another in someone with a pacemaker based specifically just because they have a pacemaker, probably not indicated. So the graphic on the far right shows the five uh, position uh, letters or numbers. And remember that the first one is chamber paced, the second is chamber sensed, response to sensing is three, and then you have things like programmability and rate modulation. Some people have pacers that will crank up as they get more active and kick up their heart rate, and some in the fifth position have anti-tachy dysrhythmia functions where uh, they can deliver shock, for example. The next keyword is ACLS uh, medicine routes. routes. What location should we give medications during ACLS, and of course intravenous and centrally are optimal, but if you don't have an IV or central line, intraosseous is preferred when you don't have that IV access available. All age groups, uh, drugs can be given intraosseous, and uh, when you practice it, you can place an IO in less than one minute. It's more predictable absorption than is an endotracheal tube, and again, any drug that you can give IV, you can also give intraosseous. If you had to give a drug endotracheal, remember the uh, mnemonic navel. Uh, 
naloxone, atropine, vasopressin, although vasopressin is no longer indicated in ACLS guidelines, uh, epinephrine and lidocaine can be given down an endotracheal tube. You are not going to give bicarbonate down an endotracheal tube and bleach the lungs. It's highly alkaline and would damage the lungs. So bicarbonate and calcium are not part of this to administer down the endotracheal tube. If you do use the endotracheal route, remember the dose is about two times the intravenous or interosseous dose. If you dilute it in some saline, shoot it down the endotracheal tube, ventilate the patient, it's delivered via um, the alveolar capillaries. So the graphic on the right shows if you're an adult cardiac arrest, you're starting CPR, you're checking the rhythm, you're shocking them early, uh, get uh, access either intravenous or intraosseous if possible. The last thing would be endotracheal administration of those drugs. Cardiac tamponade, anesthesia management. Uh, if you have fluid around the heart, that's an effusion, and the asterisk at the top right graphic shows an effusion around the heart. If that effusion or fluid around the heart um, impairs filling, especially of the low pressure chambers of the heart, that's considered tamponade physiology. And there's obstruction of diastolic filling such that the stroke volume, cardiac output, and blood pressure go down. If you have a bag of fluid under pressure surrounding all the chambers of the heart, during diastole, all those chambers of the heart are subjected to that pressure, and there's equalization of pressure. So if your CVP is reading 19, your PAD is reading 20, and your wedge is reading 21, those are all pretty much the same, and that's called diastolic equalization, and that would be compatible with the usual pressures that we see in a tamponade physiologic state. Beck's triad refers to the fact that in the cardiac tamponade patient, their blood pressure's down, their jugular uh, veins are distended, their heart sounds are distant because of the fluid around their heart. Kuzmal's sign refers to that when you take a breath and the lungs inflate around that bag of fluid, it squeezes the bag and uh, jugular venous uh, pressures go up and you have distension. Pulsus paradoxus refers to, again, when you take that inspiration, the lungs go up and squeeze the bag, the heart, with fluid in it, that um, the heart cannot fill as well and there's a drop in blood pressure. We make the diagnosis by echo, chest x-ray is not very sensitive, and the treatment is to keep the person fast, full, tight, and hard. Full, preload up, uh, fast, don't let them get bradycardic. We don't want to impair filling of the heart any more than it already is impaired, so high peak airway pressures and pre, uh, that is PEEP, uh, should be avoided if possible and if you can keep the person breathing spontaneously that would be awesome because negative pressure breathing uh, improves venous return. So we don't want the SVR down, we want their heart rate up, we want to maintain contractility and uh, ketamine is a good drug if you need to induce general anesthesia. You don't have to put some of these patients to sleep if they're in extremis and think subxiphoid pericardiocentesis under local anesthetic with a little ketamine sedation could be done. Or if they're really bad, putting uh, femoral cannulas in and getting ready to go on bypass if they crash during induction. The next key word is myocardial ischemia and beta blockers. Um, beta blockers decrease the myocardial oxygen demand and improve the myocardial oxygen supply of the heart. They decrease myocardial oxygen demand because they decrease contractility, and they are also decreasing the heart rate. They increase myocardial oxygen supply because as the heart rate goes down, it spends more time in diastole, and you remember that the left ventricle receives most of its blood supply during diastole. It's been two important uh, trials and uh, recommendations that we have now, the POISE trial, which uh, beta blockers given to beta blocker naive, that is starting beta blockers in patients that were not on beta blockers, was associated with decreasing the risk of non-fatal MI, but we paid for it with an increased risk of stroke and actually mortality. So this uh, resulted in a recommendation that, yeah, we should continue beta blockers in patients that are already on it and don't withdraw them, but um, few studies support the effectiveness of uh, giving them to patients um, um, who are not on them preoperatively because there's a higher relative risk for stroke and bradycardia. Next key word is nitric oxide mechanism of action. When you have someone breathe nitric oxide, 
In the graphic on the far right, it shows nitric oxide going into the lung, the capillaries uh, uh, next to that alveolar unit being exposed to nitric oxide. Nitric oxide goes in and causes vasodilation via cyclic uh, GMP mechanism. And then the nitric oxide binds to the hemoglobin that is going by that uh, alveolar unit. And bound nitric oxide to hemoglobin no longer causes vasodilation. So we have selective vasodilation of the pulmonary vasculature without vasodilation of the systemic vasculature and therefore consider nitric oxide a selective pulmonary vasodilator used to treat pulmonary hypertension in people with RV failure. Again, it's cyclic GMP mediated. It um, can improve uh, VQ mismatch because uh, NO is selectively delivered to the well-ventilated alveoli and then is going to improve blood flow to them. And again, it does not bind, um, it does not dilate, that is, the systemic vasculature because it binds to hemoglobin and is removed uh, from having an effect. Some uh, effects or toxicity of nitric oxide are listed next, and that is met hemoglobin can be formed. Um, immunosuppression, it inhibits platelet adhesion and aggregation, and you should not stop it. If you're on 40 parts per million in the ICU and you turn it to zero, you can have a rebound effect and sudden increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, and this is not why. So a titration off is usually recommended when it's being utilized. So the mechanism, mechanism of action is nitric oxide in the alveolus, cyclic GMP, vasodilation of the blood vessels supplying that alveolar unit. Carcinoid syndrome and complications of such are next. And the picture on the right shows a person with flushing who uh, has serotonin being excreted uh, from a vasoactive tumor that is often in the GI system. Five to 10% of carcinoid tumors secrete these vasoactive substances that when they escape breakdown in the liver, they can cause the carcinoid syndrome of flushing, diarrhea, and bronchial constriction. And specific treatment is octreotide, is one drug, or somatostatin, histamine blockers, ipotropium, an anticholinergic that is a bronchodilator and can be inhaled, because there's been some recommendations that beta agonists may actually exacerbate the release of the serotonin. So if someone had serotonin release and carcinoid syndrome occurring and they're severely bronchoconstricted, you might reach for ipotropium, octreotide, and histamine blockers before you'd reach for uh, epinephrine and beta agonists, although there's some controversy over this. 5-HIAA, hydroxyindoleacetic acid in the urine, is one of the things that is measured for carcinoid syndrome. And the treatment specifically is uh, somatostatin which blocks a serotonin effect, uh, release of serotonin, that is. And carcinoid syndrome affects other parts of the body, the heart being one, all of that serotonin um, goes to the right side of the heart and can cause fibrosis of the valves and then of the endocardium. If the endocardium becomes fibrosed, it can become restricted. If the valves become fibrosed, they can become insufficient or stenotic. And right-sided valves, um, specifically tricuspid insufficiency, the most common or pulmonary valve uh, problems, uh, can occur when all of this serotonin is pouring into the right side of the heart. Now, normally the lung metabolizes and clears serotonin, so the mitral and the aortic valve are not characteristically affected by these high levels of serotonin. Protamine reaction, next keyword. When protamine is administered and administered rapidly, you can have hypotension from arterial vasodilation and venodilation. The blood pressure goes down, the CVP goes down, and on your echo, you see a small left and right ventricle. That's garden variety protein rea or protamine reaction. So what do you do? You just stop the protamine, give a little volume, give them some phenylephrine or calcium, and if you would have given it slower, and with a vasoconstrictor, you would not have seen this type 1 protamine reaction of vaso and venodilation. Now, one of the worrisome uh, protamine reactions is um, anaphylaxis or anaphylactoid or catastrophic pulmonary hypertension. Protamine is polycationic, meaning it has NH4+. Plus. It's from um, polyamine. It's from uh, salmon sperm. 
and if it's a polyamine polycationic, it can react with other things that look similarly molecularly. So neutral protamine hagedorn insulin would be one, and previous exposure uh, to heparin apparently uh, increases the risk also. Catastrophic pulmonary hypertension, when you give protamine and suddenly your right ventricle is dilating and not working well, your pulmonary hypertension is huge, uh, your left ventricle is severely underloaded, so it's like the right side's dilating, the left side's small, you're severely uh, hypotensive, and um, you've just given protamine. Think, this could be a catastrophic pulmonary reaction, thromboxane and C5A anaphylaxin, anaphylactoxins uh, mediated, and the PVR is super high, the pulmonary arteries are constricted. So what do you do in this case? Well, obviously stop your protamine, Doses of epinephrine sometimes can get you by. Occasionally you have to go back on cardiopulmonary bypass after reheparinizing and sometimes even come off bypass without any protamine being administered and obviously dealing with the bleeding issues as heparin's half-life at normal therapy is about 60 minutes or so. Medications that prolong the QT interval. Uh, in a previous video cast, I've talked about this um, on the pharmacology keywords of 2018. Let's briefly review it here. Medications that prolong the QT interval include things like amiodarone and sotalol, antidysrhythmics, opioids like methadone, and uh, antiemetics like dropyridol, haldol, and are commonly used on Dancitron or Zofran. QT interval is shown on the top right, and when it's greater than about 440, 450, 460 milliseconds, we say that uh, if it's QT corrected for the uh, rate of the patient that long, that's a prolonged QT interval, and it puts them at risk for dysrhythmias. Now, this, the acquired form is the most common medication-related, but there's also congenital forms of long QT syndrome where there's problems with some of the cardiac ion channels, and they can have syncope and sudden cardiac death. They're treated with beta blockers and often have ICDs in place. Uh, to try to prevent this sudden cardiac death uh, due to dysrhythmias. Some can even have left cardiac sympathetic denervation uh, procedures done uh, in an attempt to uh, fix the problem of uh, sudden cardiac death from the dysrhythmia. So there's something wrong with the sympathetic innervation uh, of the heart, it appears, and there's something wrong with the cardiac ion channels. And when these patients who have prolonged QT interval have adrenergic stimulation, this puts them at increased risk for torsades or polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is shown at the far right, at the red arrow. You can see the polymorphic, each beat looks a little bit different, ventricular tachycardia, uh, and then sinus rhythm coming back in, in between episodes, and this is characteristic of torsades. Now, if a patient had torsades and it continued and didn't spontaneously come back into a, a sinus rhythm, you would have to uh, defibrillate the patient. Um, and if they were coming in and out of torsades, you would do one thing, stop the medications that were prolonging the QT interval, if that was the cause. Um, and two, magnesium is a specific treatment for torsades. Make sure they're not hypocalcemic or hypomagnesemic. And in these patients with congenital prolonged QT syndrome, they're already on beta blockers because it's blocking the adrenergic stimulation, which increases the risk, so you better not stop their beta blockers that they're already on if they're coming for surgery. So continue the beta blockers in these uh, patients who have uh, QT intervals that are prolonged, QT syndromes. Um, inhaled anesthetics are known to prolong the QT interval, but can you give a SIBO, ISO, or DES anesthetic to some of the long QT interval? Well, apparently it's okay if they're on beta blockers, but you also have TIVA that doesn't affect the QT interval as much, and so that might be an option. As pointed out, correct the magnesium deficiency if it's present, or potassium deficiency, and avoid drugs like Zofran that can increase the QT interval. And I often will put pads on patients that are at risk for any type of dysrhythmia, and so having pads available for uh, defibrillation or pacing if it was needed might be wise. The next uh, keyword is vasopressin and its mechanism of action. Vasopressin is a non-adrenergic vasoconstrictor. It doesn't work through the alpha-1 receptor like phenylephrine, but through a V1 receptor on vascular smooth muscle. On the graphic on the right, 
is attempting to show some of the things that cause the release of vasopressin from our pituitary. Things like hyperosmolarity. Well, why would that release vasopressin? Because vasopressin has two effects. One, its V2 effect is on the kidney to resorb more fluid. And if you're hyperosmolar, you want to absorb more water and uh, reduce that osmolarity with free water reabsorption. If you're hypovolemic, um, you would want more volume. And so that's a stimulus for vasopressin release, as is hypotension. hypotension. Vasopressin via the V1 receptor causes vasoconstriction and raises the blood pressure. Interesting thing about vasopressin, it seems to have a less effect on the pulmonary vascular resistance. So if you have someone with pulmonary hypertension uh, who you're trying to raise the SVR, giving vasopressin versus norepinephrine or phenylephrine may be uh, more effective at raising SVR without also raising PVR. It used to be part of our ACLS protocols and it was uh, great because you could give vasopressin and then not worry about it because its half-life was about 20 minutes instead of uh, giving epinephrine as a vasoconstrictor which had to be given every three to five minutes but ACLS has been simplified, vasopressin has been removed, it's not that it's not effective as a vasoconstrictor, it's just that it became complicated and people would forget doses apparently, and so epinephrine is there in our ACLS protocol to provide requisite vasoconstriction to improve the quality of CPR and perfusion of our organs during prolonged CPR. Another thing that's interesting about vasopressin, if you have someone who's on an ACE or ARB that's been continued perioperatively and you get into a hypotension that just seems not to be responding to the usual things. Vasopressin seems to be especially effective. So ACE or ARB induced perioperative hypotension, think vasopressin. And in cases where there's acidosis concomitantly present and you're resuscitating a patient, vasopressin may work better than a catecholamine because catecholamines tend not to work very well in an acidotic state. The next key word is drugs that are used to provide controlled hypotension and their mechanisms. We have vasodilators like nitroprusside that works through cyclic GMP and nitroglycerin that works through cyclic GMP. And the graphic on the far right shows the smooth uh, vascular muscle uh, with nitric oxide, cyclic GMP going up. And when cyclic GMP goes up in red, it causes relaxation of the vascular smooth muscle, be it in the arteries or the venules. In the case of nitroprusside, we get mainly vasodilation predominantly, and in the case of nitroglycerin, we tend to get uh, venial dilation mainly uh, with capacitant vessels uh, dilating. However, there's crossover into both. Um, and then look at PDE5 over on the far right in green. PDE5 would be sildenafil as an example, uh, which blocks the breakdown of cyclic AMP and provides uh, relaxation of blood vessels and is used for uh, erectile dysfunction treatment. So breaking breakdown of cyclic GMP would be inhibited by a PD5 inhibitor. We can also control uh, blood pressure and drop it with alpha blockers, although we rarely do this anymore except in patients with uh, pheochromocytoma. Phentolamine uh, or regitine is a reversible uh, non-selective alpha blocker. While selective alpha blockers like telazoline or prazosin or doxazosin are occasionally used, not very commonly. Remember that alpha agonist is phenylephrine, alpha blocker is these drugs that are used for like treatment of pheochromocytoma. Nicardabine works through a calcium channel blocker and is used occasionally to control, uh, provide controlled hypotension also. Last couple slides, cyanide toxicity uh, as a key word. The high infusion rates of nitroprusside can put you at risk for cyanide toxicity. Characteristically, when you get above two mics per kilo per minute, um, uh, that's when patients seem to be especially at risk. So high infusion rates, high doses, although higher concentrations than this too can probably be used for short periods of time to drop a blood pressure in someone. It's when you're infusing it for a long period of time at high doses that you get the free cyanide ion that can poison our cytochrome oxidase system. Where else can you get cyanide other than from nitroprusside? If someone is in a burning building and there's burning plastic inhalation and they're pulled out, not only can they have carbon monoxide, but they can have cyanide. And if the cyanide poisons the cytochrome oxidase system, you can't use oxygen at the tissue level.
and that patient will develop metabolic acidosis with lactic acidosis because they're not using oxygen in the tissues and it just goes around and around this the mixed venous oxygen will actually go up one of the things that will tip you off to cyanide toxicity is not only that you're using high doses of it in a, uh, a patient on nitroprusside, but they're becoming tachyphylaxis or tachyphylactic, meaning that you're having to increase the dose more and more and more to get the same blood pressure effect. And then you draw a blood gas and see an acidosis uh, and your mixed venous is going up. Those would be all indicators of this is patient on nitroprusside is developing cyanide toxicity. So how do you treat cyanide toxicity? First of all, the graphic on the far right shows nitroprusside being administered, free cyanide uh, ion being formed, which has its uh, vascular dilating effect. But we want to get rid of cyanide, and the way to get rid of cyanide is several. The first is provide um, thiol sulfate, sodium thiol sulfate. The sulfur uh, in the presence of rodinase, uh, an enzyme in your liver, it puts that sulfur on cyanide and forms thiocyanate, SCN. And thiocyanate, if you have kidneys that are functioning, can be excreted. If you don't have kidneys, it can build up and cause toxicity in and of itself. So a sulfur donor, sodium thiosulfate, is one treatment. Uh, another treatment is vitamin B12. And in our emergency room here, we have hydroxycobalamin, or cyano kit here on the bottom left uh, example. And uh, vitamin B12 in high doses can be given and uh, uh, help get rid of the, of the cyanide. Another thing that occasionally is used is amyl nitrate. Amyl nitrate takes hemoglobin and oxidizes it to methemoglobin. And methemoglobin can bind free cyanide uh, and form cyanomethemoglobin and take it out of the system so the free cyanide can't poison the cytochrome oxidase system and we can merrily go along and use oxygen again. So thiocyanate and vitamin B12, occasionally amyl nitrate as our treatments for cyanide toxicity. The last key word is retrograde cardioplegia. What are some of the indications for such? Cardioplegia can be given uh, retrograde through the coronary sinus in the graphic at the far right. The blue arrow shows the uh, retrograde catheter going through the atrial wall and then being placed into the coronary sinus advanced in a little balloon blown up and then high potassium containing solutions given through the veins of the heart into the muscle of the heart back out the coronary arteries back out into the aorta retrograde and that stops the heart and diastole so it doesn't use as much oxygen and protects the myocardium during cardiac surgery uh, we can also give cardioplegia antegrade down the aorta with an aortic cross clamp on <clears throat> forces it the cardioplegia to go down the coronary arteries into the myocardium what are the indications for retrograde? Well, it's often combined in standard coronary bypass graft surgery with antigrade. It just is a good way to ensure that you've adequately um, stopped the heart, rested it in diastole, and, and uh, 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 prevented, hopefully, ischemia during the time that it's at cardiac standstill and you're operating on it. Valvular heart surgery especially has an indication for retrograde cardioplegia, especially the aortic valve. Obviously, you have the little coronaries and their entrance to the um, uh, left and right coronary artery at the base of the uh, aorta at the level of the aortic valve and if you're tearing out that aortic valve and putting another one in uh, it's pretty hard to continuously give antegrade cardioplegia and therefore it's easier to use a retrograde cardioplegia so valve surgery especially aortic valve or aortic surgery itself is an indication for retrograde cardioplegia this is the end of the cardiac 2018 keywords and uh, good luck to you. This is a picture on the left from the Oregon coast from a trip I took from Seattle to San Francisco on my bike in Seattle, a thousand miles with my tent and sleeping bag. Uh, beautiful trip uh, along the coast. Hope you have a good day.